Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute, and I'm delighted today that my guest, Dr. Bilan Chua, is going to address for us one of the most important concerns here in the state of Hawaii, and that is how do we develop a culture of entrepreneurship or a culture in which we have great vision about business that's going to reach across the world. That's not only important for our economy, it's important for our children and the kind of future that they'll have in the 21st century and beyond. Uh, Bileng Chua has been an academic who has studied the subject matter of entrepreneurship. She has a strong teaching career and has started entrepreneurial centers in the Chinese University of Hong Kong at Hawaii Pacific University and elsewhere. And I'm delighted today that we are able to talk to her in her capacity as the executive director of one of the original business accelerators here in Hawaii called High Beam. That's H-I with a small i and then Beam. I'll let her tell you what it means. But let's talk with Bileng, learn a little bit more about entrepreneurship, and see how we can apply some principles that work across the world here in the state of Hawaii. Bileng, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be here. Well, I'm delighted. I always enjoy when we meet and talk. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not even planned. I, I, we've met overseas just by accident. That's right. And uh, you do quite a bit of travel, don't you? Yes, I do. I, I always plan to go back to Asia at least twice a year and each time for a substantial amount of time so that I can meet all the people that I know and to meet new people so that I can maintain the linkages and build new linkages between uh, Hawaii and Hong Kong and Singapore. Absolutely, and that's an important subject matter between you and me. We've talked often about the bridge between Hawaii and Singapore and Hong Kong and mm -hmm. You've been working at Actually, you're a citizen of Singapore, aren't you? Yes, I am. And, but you worked for a long time in Hong Kong. Right. I lived and worked in Hong Kong for about 18 All years right. before moving here in 2007. So I'm also a permanent resident of Hong Kong. And you're here in the United States leading one of the important institutions here in Hawaii, High Beam. Tell us a quick uh, bit about High Beam. All right. High Beam stands for Hawaii Business Entrepreneur Acceleration Mentors. Like you said, it was one of uh, Hawaii's earliest accelerators. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a very simple mission, and that is to help Hawaii build an entrepreneurial environment or an ecosystem so that um, technology entrepreneurs can flourish. So you're talking about all the elements when you say ecosystem that go mm -hmm. into helping entrepreneurs flourish, everything from the funding to the infrastructure to the technology whether we even have internet access, mm -hmm. everything. Right, yes. So what we, what we are good at mm -hmm. is because of the composition of our board members and our mentors is that we're ability, we have the ability to mentor organizations or mentor entrepreneurs and get them to, the, uh, to further rounds of funding because one of the criteria is that they would have to raise their first round of funding. And um, by the time they come to High Beam, they would have um, the kind of ambulatory, which means that they have hands and legs, but they still need a lot of um, advice and uh, guidance and insights into how to build this company and to grow. So you combine your academic background and research into entrepreneurship with your international frame of reference and your network here with movers and shakers and people who have wealth. You bring all that together so that somebody who wants to start a company or a team that wants to start a business mm -hmm. has at its disposal everything it needs. Right. Actually, the companies would already have started. All right. And the, the, the reason why I joined High Beam or was invited to join High Beam is, uh, is that High Beam was ready to build out its Asian strategy. So, so in building out its Asian strategy, we also help our own portfolio companies get into Asia for the higher rounds of funding. So what we do is that we connect our companies to potential investors sure. and get them ready for those higher rounds of funding. And we know that in Asia, there is, uh, there is an opportunity to raise funds there, but there's also a lot of work that has to be done to get to that stage of readiness. There seems as though there might be a symbiotic relationship between developing a company here in terms of mentoring it, mm -hmm. uh, helping it to gain access to all the resources it needs, 
-hmm. here in Hawaii, but getting the funding from Asia. Yes. And do you, do you deliberately try to work in terms of that kind of relationship? Absolutely. And uh, which is why I, in a way, when I go to Asia, I do talk to the people mm -hmm. there um, about the the companies that are in Hawaii, the technology companies, their products, and their um, innovative um, prototypes that would be ready for the Asian market. Sure. But only if, if yeah. their market is in Asia, that would make a lot of sense. If their market is mm -hmm. in Europe, Asian investors may be interested, but the likelihood of them being interested would be higher if you are poised, let's say, for the Asian market or the China market. So you're working with individual companies and helping them to be attractive to that funding exactly. that would come from Asia. Now let, let's go up a scale mm -hmm. a little bit. Instead of the micro scale of those particular companies, mm -hmm. think about the economic picture here in Hawaii. How are we doing in terms of being a business bridge in the Pacific mm -hmm. uh, to Asia? As a, as a state, how are we doing? Right. There, if you look at what the government is doing, mm -hmm. I think they are doing what they 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 are on the right track. So, for example, we have DBET, uh -huh. Department of Business and Economic Development, and correct, tourism. yes, and um, and within DBET there is um, the Hawaii Strategic Development uh, Corporation. All right, and that is um, and they have a they have a mission and a mandate to kind of help Hawaii build out its entrepreneurship environment as well. So you, you do have that desire and that, that mission to do just that. Well, I think you're right that we do have a structure in place and we have an entire uh, cabinet department of government mm -hmm. focused on that. To be honest, B. Lang, sometimes I hear a bit of frustration Mm -hmm. about that. I, I was talking recently with an, an Asian businessman mm -hmm. who, who thinks that we have missed all, all of the major windows mm -hmm. that have opened up. The, mm -hmm. the window to become a financial center of the Pacific, the window to become a high-tech center, and so forth. Mm -hmm. so, so what are your thoughts in, in terms of this? And I know you're not being disrespectful okay. to the government. <laughs> you're a very polite person. But, right. but, but, <laughs> Thank you. But what are your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I always believe that it's never too late unless you know that the world is going to end tomorrow. Well, I love that optimism. <laughs> yes, but having said that, there's a lot of work to be done. Much and, more that we can do. Right, and actually, I would say that, in, that um, it's not enough to just make proclamations that we're the, in the center of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we are in the center of the Pacific, but nobody is really coming to us. You know, we're kind of bypass. Bypass. And you know, I often hear the phrase that venture the, capital flies over Hawaii. Is, right. Is that right? Yes, yes. They, some of them do come uh -huh. here, but a lot of it is through efforts of uh, people who are in Hawaii, and they reached out to these VCs to come to Hawaii. to Venture have a, capital. Yeah, yes. venture capital to, to come and meet the companies. But I think being in the middle of the Pacific, mm -hmm. we cannot wait for investors or customers to come to us. We have to go out because nobody wants to make that 11 hour, I think it's more than 11 hours, it's like 13 to 15 hours just to come to Hawaii. But it makes sense if they have to go to the US mainland and then include ha Hawaii in, in, its, uh, in its program. That's right. But we, I don't think we can say that we're we're the gateway or we're the center of the Pacific and every, everybody has to come through us. It's just, not, um, it's just not realistic. So what you are saying is that we won't be that gateway or, or that centrally located place of business. Geographically. Unless, right, mm -hmm. unless we actually produce those companies that will attract the capital from outside. Yes. And we're not, we're not talking about this the mainstay industries of tourism or, or real estate purchasing. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the development of companies for the 21st century, largely high-tech based, th that can have a global market. Exactly. Exactly. So we have to we have to first take an inventory of what we have and what we can offer the world. And I think H Hawaii has a lot of uh, strengths. You know, it has some uh, it has ocean science, it has aquaculture, it has 
uh, specialty agriculture, and uh, it has the the astronomy. Yes, the and, some of the clearest skies in the world. Right, and a lot of top world scientists are coming here, and they, of course, you know, when you have grants and you have these scientists coming, it's not uh, they come with 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 money too and employment. Right. When you talk about these areas, uh, agriculture, well, aquaculture, mm -hmm. high tech, uh, astronomy, and so forth, uh, medical research, I might add to that. We have a cancer center here and so right. forth. When we talk about these things, it, it appears that Hawaii is an ideal place for business startup. And I know you're very much focused on business mm -hmm. startups at mm -hmm. the initial stages. Uh, how is that right? Because I often hear that, that that we do have businesses starting up here, not necessarily growing, but how are we as a climate for startups, a place that attracts bright, brilliant people to come around an idea in, in a nice place to live as well? Mm -hmm. Well, in the community, there are different uh, groups that are doing just that. Just for example, uh, University of Hawaii, they have the pace. The, all right. uh, Pacific Asia Entrepreneurship Center and uh, we have all these new accelerators that have been uh, seeding new companies helping entrepreneurs to start their business um, and providing them with the initial education but once when they graduate what next you know you you, you need you need an environment that would um, help them to grow and um, and to get out to those markets, so so like you said, growing companies, it would be the next challenge. So we do have right at this moment, we do have a lot of efforts in uh, encouraging new business mm -hmm. startups, but to get them to a stage where they grow and they become very attractive to the next round of funding, which would help them to get into the uh, to the manufacturing and and distribution um, that would be another kind of funding and um, they may have to go out of Hawaii to get that well I, I would imagine th that the resources needed to take a company beyond startup mm -hmm. and to a level of global viability mm -hmm. are, are immense they yes. have to have a, a marketplace that's big enough for, for their product. Mm -hmm. They have to have the capital in order, uh, uh, enough capital. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to have a labor source as well. So are you suggesting that these are some of the real challenges? Are, are there other challenges that, that as well that are faced here in Hawaii that make it difficult to grow a company? Um, well, definitely, you know, there is the, uh, the mindset of the entrepreneur. And, um, and you have to be pretty resilient and persistent mm -hmm. to want to grow. Sometimes um, entrepreneurs, when they, or people who start business, once they come to the first hurdle, they, it would be, they could be overwhelmed with it and not push through. Mm. And, um, and instead of, if they don't get the money, they, they, the funding that they need, they will go through other ways you know they could bootstrap or they could sure. come up with other ways to come up with the funding that they need maybe make a little mm -hmm. bit and then sell what they have and then mm -hmm. use that to but finance find the a next. way no matter you have, what you have to find a way we're going to yes. take a quick break but when we come back i'd like to talk about that uh idea of what entrepreneurship is mm -hmm. that, that you're referring to here All right. and, and whether there are some standards for measuring how, whether a place is entrepreneurial. My guest mm -hmm. today is Professor Bilang Chua who is the executive director of Highbeam. She helps businesses to succeed and to succeed in the 21st century in an international way. We need that in Hawaii. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this short message. Hi, aloha. My name is Chris Leatham and I have host a show called The Economy and You. Uh, the show plays every Wednesday at noon, and on my show, I bring on guests who are interested or working in the technology space, and uh, so I'd like you to come and watch the show and learn with me about all the sort of exciting things that we're doing in Hawaii to build and grow our economy ecosystem. So I'd like to say aloha, and I look forward to seeing you on the show. Thank you. Aloha, Yappers. This is your host, King Zilli, for The Yap Show. Every Friday, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. You can catch us here live 
Think Tank Hawaii, and then later on we upload to our YouTube channel. We talk about youth issues, policies, uh, youth programs, and how to transition yourself into adulthood. But this was like a sign, I guess. Hey, Mike's like, hey, <laughs> right. now's your chance to go back to school, which uh, I'm doing. Catch us here again live 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back to Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'd like to say thanks to Jay Fidel, the producer and founder of the network, and all of the wonderful board members, the donors, the staff and volunteers who make things work. In fact, every week, about 25 to 30 hours of original content is produced here in Honolulu, Hawaii, and sent across the world. And we say aloha to all of you viewers who are everywhere, everywhere on the planet because we believe in globalization. Now, well, you can see what we're doing at www.thinktechhawaii.com. All the programs are there. We're back today with Bileng Chua talking about entrepreneurship. She's the executive director of High Beam Hawaii. Bileng, you have studied entrepreneurship all your life. And, and in answer to my question in the first segment as to what Hawaii needs, you said there has to be an entrepreneurial mindset. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. Well, an entrepreneurial mindset is, um, is needed to, um, to be able to have an idea or to be problem-oriented, problem -oriented, not to be afraid of problems, because ev with every problem there's a, a solution, and that solution is an opportunity for a, could be an opportunity for a business or even a, an opportunity to solve a social problem. So I would say that entrepreneurial mindset is not just for starting businesses, it's just to undertake sure. a, a venture. It could be even like a project, can also, you can also apply the entrepreneurial process to a project. It's bringing, having a vision mm -hmm. and, and bringing it to life making it happen. Well, you know, you talk about this entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. and, and frankly, what I see in, in the modern history of Hawaii, going back to the 18th century and the 19th century, mm -hmm. is there were, uh, there have been a, a large number of people who've come to Hawaii, Chinese, mm -hmm. the, the Filipinos, the, all, all ethnic groups, who have worked very hard and, and taken the opportunity to start businesses, and many of them have succeeded. So. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurship seems to be part of our cultural fabric. But there seems to be another dynamic, would you say also? We have a whole bunch of people over the last 70 years with the growth of the unions, the growth of the military presence, the growth of government, mm -hmm. who belong to these large organizations mm -hmm. and who basically need to be careful not to rock the boat so they don't mm -hmm. get fired and they work until they have earned their pension. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but that seems to be a dynamic that's very different from mm -hmm. entrepreneurial mindset. That's right. The entrepreneurial growth or the experience of any country um, will evolve through the time. So I would say that the early immigrants were very entrepreneurial because they left everything to take and took a lot of physical right. risk and they were separated from their families to come to a new land. And you need that kind of mindset to take that kind of action. But I would say that even when they started businesses in those days, in those early years, they did it out of necessity because okay. there were no jobs, right? I mean, there were no other, there were no large companies to employ them. Uh, so they, if they had to start a business, it would be out of, out of need to do that. And, and the, their lives would probably have been very hard. And in addition to running a business, they would also have to take care of their families. So what do you do when you tell your, um, your children? You know, I mean, you want them to get a good education. And if they have any desire to uh, start a business, you would say, oh no, life is too hard as a business. Mm -hmm. Study hard and work for a company. Well, that's very interesting because I, I know so many stories where the mother or the father would would not be able to quite make it in the plantation so they would start to do entrepreneurship mm -hmm. a business on the side whether it was food or whether it was laundry whether mm -hmm. and they'd save money and they'd start this business but they'd end up teaching their children 
to be part of the system, to get good jobs and stay in those good jobs, or to get education sure. that would give them professions. And then the, that entrepreneurial spirit seems to disappear after a yes, few they, generations. Yeah, they become professionals and they become very good at that. Um, but, uh, and that's, that's because, so the, the cultural norms, the cultural values would be very important in cultivating or sustaining that, that entrepreneurial mindset. And I'm not saying that this is, also, this is just the Hawaii experience. I would say that even in other countries, you know, a Asian countries, um, like Hong Kong and Singapore, they also had this similar experience mm -hmm. where the early entrepreneurs were out of necessity and they just wanted to, to educate their children so that children will sure. be employed and have a steady income and would not suffer mm -hmm. as they did. So what I think I hear you saying is this, that as, as commendable as entrepreneurship out of necessity is, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't necessarily create a, an entrepreneurial culture because once people have those needs met, and are able to provide for their children, they want them to be able to be stable and secure. So then the entrepreneurship and the risk factor mm -hmm. goes away. Um, I really do think that here in Hawaii, the plantation mindset and the, the pension mindset mm -hmm. and so forth have kind of put a damper on mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. Right. And there have been studies which, which says that, um, that the larger proportion percentage of the, the, the population is employed by the government, the lower the level of entrepreneurial activity. Well, that's fascinating because there, there is a study that shows that Hawaii has one of the highest per capita rates of mm -hmm. government employment, whether it be military, federal, state, city, uh, in the entire nation. So mm -hmm. that might very well correlate to what we see as a lack of entrepreneurial climate. Right. What I also would like to propose one thing is that uh, we, we shouldn't kind of um, uh, condemn the large corporations right. for, create, for fostering this lack of entrepreneurial activity. Corporations are pretty smart too. If they create an environment where there is innovation and there's creativity to, um, to take place, because they always need uh, to come up with new That's products right. and services, they can attract employees, people who have that entrepreneurial desire because now the environment is within the corporation. So they, right. they are sucking in all the mm -hmm. entrepreneurial talent that is out there. Um, they could be starting their own businesses, but they found that ability to, to uh, live out their entrepreneurial tendencies or desires or mindset right. in a corporate setting. We could foster intrapreneurship exactly. within the corporation. Mm -hmm. For, for talented people as well. One of the reasons that, that I invited you uh, on board today is, is I'm fascinated by a study that you are very familiar with called the GEM. Yes. Uh, what does GEM stand for? It stands for Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, and it was started in 1999 to measure the level of uh, early stage entrepreneurial activity across countries. So the consortium is, are researchers and universities with that um, with that mission to come up with a measure of entrepreneurial activity in their respective countries. How many countries have been measured? Right now, uh, last year it was 70 countries. So this index measures the entrepreneurial activity at an early stage of about 70 different countries. And, and I would imagine you'd have Hong Kong and Singapore in there, the United States, you, People's Republic, is it one of the yeah, countries? Yeah, China would be one as of well, them. As well, and so yes. forth, and India. The, yes. Well, this is fascinating. Uh, what, what are some of the categories in, in which they measure entrepreneurial activity? Okay, so um, first of all, we have to, we cannot measure oranges and apples. So okay. they divide the countries into their stages of economic development. So you have what we call the factor-driven economies that okay. are mostly the developing countries, and then the efficiency-driven, which are countries that have gone into manufacturing and large-scale production, and then you have the innovation-driven economies, and that would include countries like the United States. So you compare the countries within their Under uh, yes. economic development status, and um, and also we look for. Um, we measure entrepreneurial activity in terms of 
the environmental factors that either inhibit or enhance entrepreneurial activity, and there are nine of them. Well, that's very fascinating. In other words, there are nine factors we can look for mm -hmm. that can diagnose the entrepreneurial climate. Correct. And we can compare countries to one another. Mm -hmm. Is this at the country level or the state and province level? It, at, it's at a country Overall level. Overall at the country so, level. But we can still learn lessons that we can apply. I, I'm eager, as you can tell, to, yes. to look at, at Hawaii through these mm -hmm, lenses, mm -hmm. which we'll be able to do, won't we? Yes, you can. Uh, not statistically, uh -huh. but you can kind of do a rough measure uh, in terms looking of at the news. Best practices or values. That's right, yes. So let's start with, with just a few of these. We may have mm. a time to go through them. What's, mm. what's the first measure that is looked uh, at? It would be access to fi funding. Exactly um, what and we were it talking could be, about. Before. It could be uh, in a form of uh, venture capital funding or private equity, or it could be uh, angel funding or loans from banks or financial institutions. So the countries that are rated high in terms mm -hmm. of their entrepreneurial climate will generally have high levels of access to capital? Not necessarily, because you have to look at all the, the whole, factors. All factors Yes, together. all the factors together. But that would be one of them. Right, yes. And it, then there would be government policies all right. and programs in place, uh, education and training, um, access to markets, or market openness within the within the country, physical infrastructure, professional infrastructure, and cultural and um, and social norms that encourage or um, and that would also involve like the media, you yeah. know, because media has a role in um, in in criticizing entrepreneurs or in celebrating entrepreneurs. So too. that would be a cultural factor. Very exactly. interesting as well. Right. So while no one country may necessarily be high in all of these, the, 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 these are indexes that can tell us whether an environment is, is healthy. And maybe in, in, a country is not high in one of them, but they know how to get their capital from another country, so to speak. And Correct, that's the area yes, where they are. yes. So the highest level of, um, the country with the highest level is actually surprisingly developing countries like Uganda. Interesting. Yes, and um, so, and we know why, because it's uh, entrepreneurial activity out of necessity, because there's something in the economy that is quite broken, and uh, there are no jobs, so people have to live, they have to kind of get another means of income, and it could be businesses at very, very small scale, it could be just put a carpet on the, f on the, on the street and selling fruit or vegetables, or whatever. We take in jam measures, any kind of um, business activity uh, that you create. Um, and uh, so the countries in the developing, developing stage have more entrepreneurial activity, but of the necessity-based types. And uh, you have countries that are in the innovation-driven uh, economy, economic level and they have very low levels of entrepreneurial activity. Because I would imagine like countries like Belgium and Sweden, um, and uh, so, and, but however, their countries are doing pretty well. And would this represent a certain kind of maturing in their economy in, in, in which early levels of entrepreneurship have mm -hmm. now turned into corporate stability? And so you yes. have these corporations that are, are well-funded, mm -hmm. a mainstream part of the culture that produce the product, and people are organized around them. Correct. Which makes me wonder about Japan. How, mm -hmm. is, how is Japan rated in terms of the GEM index? Well, Japan for many years have, um, have experienced very low levels of entrepreneurial activity, like 2.8%. Mm -hmm. That's one of the lowest. I think Belgium is the, another low, uh, low rate. So, uh, but they are... Uh, the, I'm, I'm not sure, but they say that there is a um, there are cultural norms which which support some you know the youth or people to work in large companies rather than start their own businesses. And also, uh, I think Japan is at the stage where there's an aging population, mm. and they're at the stage where they're trying to conserve their. Um, their finances rather than invest in risky entrepreneurs. So there isn't that kind of a, um, a desire to, uh, to invest in new companies 
amongst the population. Sure. Well, what I find fascinating is that we now have a global index by which we can measure the entrepreneurship of different countries. So we don't just have to say, of course, Singapore is, or Hong Kong are going to be entrepreneurial mm -hmm. and this other country isn't. What I'd like to do when we come back is apply some of those categories to our analysis of Hawaii. Okay. Sound good? Yeah, sounds great. Great. My guest, Bi Leng Chua, and I are going to talk about how entrepreneurial Hawaii is when we return right after this brief message. Please, don't go away. We've got a lot coming up. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back to our final segment of Ehana Kako this week. Ehana Kako means let's work together. It's kind of like that ancient Hawaiian or old Hawaiian phrase. A pule kako, let's pray together. At the Grassroot Institute, we like to say, let's work together, because the alternative is not acceptable. That is, let's not work together. No, that doesn't work. <laughs> and one of the things we want to do at the Grassroot Institute is unite Hawaii's people to work together for a better government, economy, and society. And that's why I like Bi Leng Chua, because that's exactly what she's doing. She's helping to find solutions, and I love her optimism. She's the executive director of High Beam, helping companies and helping our state to really move forward. Well, Bi Leng, I do like your optimism. Mm -hmm. I like to think of Hawaii as having the potential and the possibility. Mm -hmm. And so now we've got a criterion by which we can uh, uh, develop Hawaii, the GEM mm -hmm. index. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that first criteria. I think if I recall, it is access to capital. That's How right. are we doing in Hawaii in terms of access to capital mm -hmm. for entrepreneurship? Okay. I think in terms of early stage mm -hmm. um, uh, business ventures, there is capital there because we do have a how angels community. When angel you say invested, angels, you, you mean angel people like Omidyar or people like uh, uh, wealthy individuals who, who, who spend part of their time here? No, it's actually residents of Hawaii oh, with, um, with surplus capital. That's right, you because know, their, not, their not home their, value has appreciated so much during the years and their pension funds, so they've got all of this capital. Yes, they, uh, and it's not the value of their homes, it's any kind of wealth that have been built up other than just what their home, the, their real estate is. So but money is available. So when you say for early an stage. angels here mm -hmm. for early stage startup, we're talking about what level of money in, in a typical startup, about how much? I would say that if, um, if a, a company needs to, needs to um, kind of build a prototype and they need that and they've done all the research which shows that there is mm -hmm. a, a market value to it, uh, they would approach the angel, um, the angel community. And the, the funds are not very big. It's like maybe 25000 minimum oh, per so investor. If, if you grew up in Manoa, that could be your parents, <laughs> which is not necessarily a yes. huge amount of money. Now, so that helps with startup, that startups don't require massive amounts of fund. Correct. They yes. They just require enough to get prototypes off the ground and, and so forth. That's right. They've they've sh they've proven or they've convinced um, themselves and and the potential investor that there is a market for okay. what they are building. So that that's good in Hawaii, but yes. but you seem to be hesitant about the next stage. Yeah. Then when they get into the growth stage where they need more capital, they may able they may they may be able to get something, but if you need you need to get more you may have to look outside Hawaii and um, and of course you know I'm be it's believed that there is a lot of that in Asia but you would have to kind of restructure your your business model or what your commercialization would, model what would make there. a business that in incubates in Hawaii attractive mm -hmm. to Asian uh, investors well they have to they have to prove or, or show that that there is a market in Asia mm -hmm. for their product okay, or their the service. Okay, the market is one nothing. Right, yes. 
And to get yourself to that, that stage, you really have to get out of Hawaii and see the market. You cannot kind of um, determine that market right. by just going through the internet and doing your research there. You have to just go out and see. So that kind of mindset, you know, and just like the early, the early ancestors that came here. Right, the, now the they voyaging have, mindset. That's right. Now they have to go and, and go into these places and see for themselves and talk to people who are going to be your potential uh, customers or your potential partners or investors that to meet them. And I think there would, might be some kind of competitive advantage for, for those who are in Hawaii because our culture uh, opens us up to people of multiple Asian cultures in particular, which I think makes it easier to carry on the, the relationship and the discourse as we go to Asia. Yes, the ethnic, the, um, the ethnic affiliation would be there. But let me say that uh, not all people from Hawaii speaks the language of, of, <laughs> of those countries, even though their, uh, their, their family way back came from these communities. And of course, you know, the, you've got the American mindset as well, and you would have to work specially hard to yes, understand right. the consumer that is in Asia. So that kind of investment in time and resources to go out there and meet people um, is really important and um, and you have to make that kind of effort to to do so and I I'm not sure if um, and I hope that people here would want to do that would have the curiosity and that desire to spend time meeting the people over there but fortunately there are expatriate Hawaii people from Hawaii living in those countries and that's a very important resource so to that's tap our to. network or what we may say in China is Guanxi uh, <laughs> yes people from Hawaii people who have lived in Hawaii or who, right. um, who are from Hawaii but now living and working in those countries mm -hmm. in fact they have been part of my network as well is that whenever I go to these uh, go go to these places I like to meet people who are from who have studied in Hawaii or who have lived in Hawaii now, the second area w would be government, and mm -hmm. uh, when I think of government as being a factor in determining an entrepreneurial climate, mm -hmm. we, we think of things that could be positive and things that are regulatory. Mm -hmm. Positive meaning tax credits or programs sponsored by the government mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. help raise capital, and then regulation being the rules, mm -hmm. and both of them play a role. How are we doing in Hawaii in terms of the government role uh, mm -hmm. in developing entrepreneurship. Right. I think the government has um, has the right vision. You know, they've got this growth, um, Hawaii Growth Initiative, which is in you know, which is doing what what we what we want them to do, which is to build out this environment that would be conducive for entrepreneurship. But also, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of like physical infrastructure mm -hmm. um, and. Um, one simple example would be broadband. Yes. You know, you, you need to invest in those things. We don't, we're not saying that the, the government should hold the hands of entrepreneurs and get them through uh, that process. But you have to make sure that uh, people can do business efficiently in Hawaii and that they can, um, they can communicate faster through broadband Certainly. so so one example would be let's say Singapore Singapore is al already at its second phase of broadband and um, and every household is connected and you can get Wi-Fi free uh, in the whole island you know so that's how committed governments can be in terms of building it and it could be even the transportation infrastructure um, the mass transit uh, system in Hong Kong and Singapore are very good for the small businesses because they can go and meet their customers uh, very quickly and they can even bring uh, parts of their products uh, you know to where they need to go sure so so uh, I remember one of your interviews was about talked about the Hawaii super ferry that would be an example of an infrastructure that would help entrepreneurs get to their markets so it's a lack of infrastructure right now to travel between islands. Right, yes. And you know what it's like in, in Hong Kong just to ride the ferry. 
you toss your coin in and you're on the other side and Kowloon exactly and back and forth mm -hmm. you so when you mention that these auxiliary services mm -hmm. that that create that determine the business climate i'm also thinking of the government's role in zoning for housing mm -hmm. and the government's role in assuring quality in the public school systems because mm -hmm. i often hear those two factors mentioned by companies that are concerned that they can't bring the professionals and the labor force in mm -hmm. as well as they'd like to because people complain about the mm -hmm. cost of housing and they complain about the quality of the schools. Is that part of the, the role of government? Um, yes, that's, that's right. So, um, so the government has to, I, I'm not sure how you would do that in Hawaii, but I know that let's say in, um, in Singapore, they have made it very attractive for companies to go there and set up their, yes. their businesses by even give them like a, a, a time when they can lease their, their, pro, their business right. property at a very, very low stage. Or even, even um, startups, they are actually encouraging startups from, from U.S. to go to Hong Kong or to Singapore to start the business and give them space free for two years. You know, it's these kinds of initiatives right. that governments can do mm -hmm. to encourage and foster entrepreneurial activity. At the same time, Bileng, uh, wouldn't, it, wouldn't you agree that it can be a catch-22? That is, government needs to do, but government can sometimes do too much, can maintain too much of a role of control and development. There may be great ideas uh, such as providing tax credits as in Act 221, mm -hmm. if you recall, but then government becomes the manager of this and, and, and we end up with a different vision than actually empowering and bringing in, in business. So let's turn to the regulatory side. How is Hawaii doing in terms of government regulation uh, as it impacts on entrepreneurial environment? Well, I think every government has to walk the fine line mm -hmm. between doing enough and doing too much yes and um, it can so I would say that the first stage would be to make sure that the physical infrastructure is helpful to new businesses and of course it's also it also means that it's um there are programs in place that would help a company kind of get themselves registered and uh, and operating as fast as possible so, and register it as fast as possible. <laughs> exactly, right, yes. And so there is that initial, mm -hmm. initial part where I think a government can, can do a one-stop shop where you can get everything that you need to do to set, up, sure. you know, to set up a business. And of course, there is like the small business uh, administration that would give uh, loans, but those loans are really not for startups. So now you have the... Uh, the accelerators for the tech for the tech companies so um, so it's um, so there is a um, there is a desire to to kind of be less regulatory but also these some um, uh, these programs have to face the legislature that's right every every year or so and to justify mm -hmm. and um, and and kind of prove themselves that they can continue to have that that money. I think that's a little uh, that's a little sad. I think you should just um, have that, uh, you know, not to kind of have to go back and that's ask right. for more. You know? And in addition to that, we've got many moving parts: the the rate of corporate income tax, mm -hmm. the GE tax at every level, and on and on. And it looks like we've got a lot of work to do. Bilan, can you believe it? We've run out of time. <laughs> We can yes. go on talking forever right. and ever about this, and I want to say how much I appreciate your global perspective and your championship of entrepreneurship for Hawaii. Well, Be thank like, you. I, I value the opportunity well, to th share. Thank you very much. My guest today has been Bilang Chua, Executive Director of High Beam, one of Hawaii's accelerators to help us build a, an entrepreneurial climate here. And that's what we need. Uh, Hawaii is not just an isolated place in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, our future, the future of our children, uh, it depends greatly upon our ability to build an entrepreneurial climate, one which spans the world. 
in every market, uh, in every way we possibly can. I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute. This is Ehana Kako. Let's work together on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Until next week, aloha.